Well, I can do my own scripture reading if I have to. We're actually going to be in the book of Acts. Uh, so if you want to mark Acts chapter 10, that's going to be our main passage is Acts chapter 10. We're going to take a look at that in just a minute. But just to set the tone for the lesson, I want us to think about Philippians 2 verses 9 through 11 and the idea of Jesus as our great king. We're going to see that a lot in this lesson, that theme played out. In Philippians 2, 9 through 11, the apostle writes, Therefore God highly exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we're going to, again, see that played out quite a bit in this lesson, this idea of Jesus as our King above all others. Just to fill you in, Preston is away from us this morning. He's preaching at a congregation up in Steele, Missouri. They're having a series of lessons this week on God and government and how the Christian should relate to civil authority. Very interesting topic, and uh, Preston was the one kicking the series off this morning, and I'm actually the one who's going to bookend it on Thursday night and bring the series to a close. So I thought that was kind of cool that Preston and I get to bookend this series on government and, and Christians and how we relate to civil authority. So just so I'm totally up front, this is my lesson from Thursday night. This is a practice run, okay? You want, to make sure, you want to make sure things are nice and polished before you take them out there for another congregation. And don't think that, I, it's not just because you guys are the lab rats or something like that. It's just a, it's good, I, I hope at least that it's useful material. And I hope that this practice run, I'll be able to see like, it, you know, exactly how I want to present it and maybe um, some things I could adjust or get some feedback on that. Uh, and so my topic on Thursday night up in Steele, Missouri is going to be, who is the ultimate authority? Because, you know, af after you get through all this stuff about do Christians pay taxes and, and what about war? What about Christians in the military? Uh, what about civil disobedience or rebellion or even our own American revolution? And those are all really important role of government and our, a Christian's responsibility and relationship to it. But at the end of the day, you, you you have to answer this question of who is the final authority? Who is really in charge of your life? Who is your king? And is anybody competing against Jesus for your allegiance? Now, we may say, well, of course Jesus is, is our king. We all acknowledge that at face value, or at least like in theory, we understand that Jesus is our king. And yet when we put it into practice, we'll say Jesus is our king, but our job or sports or even our own families or our allegiance to the United States of America as citizens of this country, do our actions betray us? We say Jesus is king, but do our actions betray us? And so that's why I want to start in Acts chapter 10 and talk about a really interesting case study in somebody who had to make a hard choice about who his king was and how that was going to actually impact his life. And that man, of course, is Cornelius. Let's start here in Acts chapter 10 and just read a little bit about him in the description from the writer. It says in Acts chapter 10, verse 1, Now there was a certain man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. In verse 2, he's described as a devout man and one who feared God with all his household. And he gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. <clears throat> so he's described as a devout person who's also a God-fearer. And I don't think we quite get the sense of it in, in English, but this term, a God-fearing man or a God-fearer, that's actually a technical term that was applied to people in this time. Like when you say that that person is a God-fearer, there's actually something pretty specific that's meant by that. 
A God-fearer was somebody who was a Gentile who was attached to a local synagogue. Now, this Gentile was not circumcised. This Gentile did not keep every element of the Jewish law. This, this Gentile was not technically or officially a proselyte to the Jewish religion, but he was someone who had sympathies for the Jews. And those sympathies may have been manifested in a curiosity, uh, donating money to the local synagogue, helping to build a local synagogue, perhaps being friendly to the Jews in that community, convert. Cornelius is described as somebody who has certainly Jewish sympathies and leanings toward the Jews in his community. F.F. F. Bruce goes on and describes in his book, New Testament History, the, the specifics of that. He says, this was a class of people loosely attached to the synagogue, interested in Jewish matters, devoted to Jewish ethics and religious customs, and generous to, generous to Jewish causes, but nevertheless content to remain technically pagan. And so as we move through the story in Acts chapter 10, and it's one that we're all very familiar with, I'm sure, but as we move to the story of Acts chapter 10, Cornelius has an encounter with the apostle Peter, who has been told, don't worry, go with these men, you're going to go and you're going to have an encounter and you're going to preach the gospel. Now, not specifically, because what specifically was he shown? A sheet full of unclean animals. And Peter was able to surmise from this vision of the sheep with the unclean animals that in the end, his job was to preach the gospel to Gentiles. And so there he is preaching the gospel, not just to Cornelius, but to Cornelius, uh, his entire family, his household is also shown the gospel. And he accepts it with fervor, zeal, excitement. He becomes a Christian that very day after hearing about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, his resurrection, and how he has now come to all people to bring them to salvation. And Cornelius, at the end of the chapter, along with his entire household, is baptized and salvation comes to them. But what was the fundamental concept that made the difference for Cornelius? And more to our lesson, was Cornelius risking something by becoming a Christian? Because I, I think, we, again, we sort of miss it if you don't have all the background. You sort of miss it like, well, yeah, of course, Cornelius heard the gospel. Uh, he believed in the gospel. He obeyed it. Sure, wonderful. And, and Cornelius becomes a Christian. Simple enough. Just like any of us would, uh, you hear the message, you hear Ryan preach, or you sit down for a Bible study, and the water's right there, or, well, it's not there right now. <clears throat> it's empty. But the water could be there, hypothetically. And you get baptized, and you're a Christian. Simple as that. But was Cornelius risking something? Was there something like really genuinely at stake for Cornelius. It's the kingship of Jesus. And I know that seems like, that seems like kind of an abrupt, like, wait, all right, so you know, what was at stake for Cornelius? Central to that was the kingship of Jesus. I, where's the connection there? Well, let's do that. Follow, follow along with me. This is, this is going to be one of those lessons that has like one main important point, and I want you to follow along with me as I get there, because there's going to be other stuff we talk about along the way, but it's this one main important point that I really, really want you to remember today. It's the kingship of Jesus and what that really means to us. Like, what does that really say about us when we declare that Jesus is our king? When you talk about the kingship of Jesus, that was at the heart of his trial as well. The enemies of Jesus, his detractors, his accusers, they knew that they were never going to get Pontius Pilate on board with a conviction and an execution on purely religious grounds. And so when you follow along in the story, there's a sequence of events that you can observe throughout the Gospels where 
In Luke chapter 22, when the accusers come before Pontius Pilate, they, they know that, well, we can't call him a false teacher. Uh, we can't call him, you know, just like a charlatan. Like he's this crazy country bumpkin preacher from Galilee. And he's confusing all of us in our religion. What, what do you think Pilate's response to that would be? I don't, I don't care. You know, if, the, if this is about your religion, I don't care. Deal with it yourself. Who cares? You know, for, for Pilate, Pilate's not interested in answering silly religious questions of these crazy Jews that, are, that, he's, that he's over in his province. Don't get me, a, don't get me up at 6 o'clock in the morning to answer questions about some charlatan preacher from the sticks. I'm not interested in that. But there's a, there is a certain kind of charge that they bring before him. Uh, let's go to Luke chapter 22 and 23, and let's read just a couple of things here. Obviously, for the sake of time, we're not going to read the entire story, but I want to highlight something just real quick here. I just want to highlight something. <clears throat> let's pick up here in Luke chapter 23 and verse 1. Then the whole body of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And in verse 3, Pilate said, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him and said, It is as you say. It's interesting, like, of all the things that they said and all the things they could have said, again, like, he's a religious false teacher, um, he, he's really causing us a lot of confusion, he's causing us a lot of trouble, we're having to adjudicate matters that we never did before, um, he does false miracles. The one that seems to catch Pilate's attention, like, the one that really grabs him is, wait, 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 hold on. Go back to that last one. What was that last one you said? That he claims to be a king. That was the one that grabbed Pilate's attention. He, I, I just imagine, and this is again, maybe me just being imaginative, Pilate sitting here, it's early in the morning, they've, they've awakened him from his sleep, and it's, it's, you know, it's like really early in the morning, and he's hearing them throwing out false accusations, complaining about this man, Jesus, and he's just like, Whatever, whatever, whatever. And then they say, and he claims to be a king, and that's when he goes, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Are you a king? Why is it that of all the things that they did say and could have said, why is it that that's the one that seems to grab Pilate's attention? Because that's the one that actually impacts him and the Romans, if Jesus is a king, that is very problematic for the Romans and the emperor. Go to John chapter 18 now. Notice a little bit here from John's account. In John chapter 18, let's start here in verse 33. Pilate therefore again entered into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Like he's very clearly preoccupied with this notion of Jesus being the king of the Jews. That is very alarming and disturbing to Pilate. He needs to get to the bottom of this. He needs to find an answer to this. And so Jesus answered in verse 34, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? And Pilate, in, in, again, what I imagine to be kind of a scoffing tone, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you up to me. What have you done? He's really trying to get to the bottom of this. I want to know, what is this about you being a king? Why, why have they brought this charge? And so Jesus said in verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting that I might not be delivered up to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, so you are a king? And Jesus said, you say correctly that I am a king. And so you get to chapter 19 then, 
And Pilate decides the best thing he can do right now is maybe if we just kind of rough Jesus up a little bit, kind of beat him up a little bit, uh, show people like, eh, don't worry about this. I'll go. I'll deal with Jesus. We'll, we'll rough him up a little bit. Things will be okay. And angrier and angrier. And only at that point, he then says, in fact, let's start in verse uh, 10, uh, just for context here. Pilate therefore said to him, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority? And it's the authority issue that's really central to this. That's where, again, that's where the, the preoccupation is with Pilate. That I have authority even to crucify you. And Jesus said in verse 11, you would have no authority over, over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me up to you has the greater sin. Now, as a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Underline that. Make note of that. Anybody who claims to be a king is making himself an enemy of Caesar. And if you support this man, you're no friend of Caesar's either. That's a sneaky, important detail. If you make yourself out to be a king... You are an enemy of Caesar. And if you are a friend of this guy, if you're a friend of Jesus, if you support him at all, then I guess you're no friend of Caesar either. And I think that gets in Pilate's head. That gets in his head. Verse 12, or verse 13. When Pilate therefore heard these words, it was those words, you're no friend of Caesar, I guess. I'm going to tattletale on you. We're going to send messages to Caesar. You're going to be in big trouble, Pilate. And as a result of those words, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judgment seat of the place called the pavement, but in Hebrew called Gabbatha. And now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. They cried out, therefore, in verse 15, away with him, away with him, crucify him. But Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? And I love, by the way, how he keeps, he keeps doubling down on this. He is not letting this go. Okay, he, he is like a dog chomping down on a bone. He is not letting this kingship issue go. I'm not letting you get away with it. I'm not letting you dodge it. I am not letting this go. You want me to crucify your king? Look, the king of the Jews. And now you want me to crucify your king? He is forcing them to say the following phrase. And so the chief priest answered in verse 15, We have no king but Caesar. That's it. Right there. That's a decision, isn't it? That is a decisive declaration. We have no king but Caesar. And I find it interesting that the last thing that Pilate does is he puts a sign over Jesus as he's being crucified. And the sign declares to all passers-by Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. What's the response, by the way? When people see this, when the chief priests see that sign, what's their response to it? No, 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 no. <laughs> let's, let's be clear here, Pilate. Don't say he was the King of the Jews. Say that he declared himself to be, that he claimed to be, that he made himself out to be. But don't, don't put this on us. And I love, by the way, how Pilate just doubles down on it. What I wrote, I wrote. And he doesn't change the sign. It's about the kingship of Jesus. And we'll get back to Cornelius in a little while, I promise. This is one of those lessons where we started over here with Cornelius and we're going to find our way back to him in, in, in just a minute. But the kingship of Jesus is important. And that whole conversation in John 19 is central to this. It's central. 
If you make yourself out to be a king, you're an enemy of Caesar. If you are a friend with that man, you're no friend of Caesar. So you want me to crucify your king? Sure, crucify him. He's no king of ours. We have no king but Caesar. That conversation is really, really important. And by the way, the kingship of Jesus is reflected in two places in the Bible. And I mean, not just two specific places, but I mean in two areas of the Bible, the kingship of Jesus, both in the Old Testament as well as what Christians believed in the New Testament. And you can write all these down. Of course, this, this is not, we don't have the time to deal with the scope of all of these things. But on the left-hand column, I put some examples of messianic prophecies. And within these messianic prophecies, frequently you find the kingship of the Messiah. That it's, it's not just when the prophets pre, excuse me, predicted the Messiah, they weren't just saying he was going to come and be a savior or a friend or just a really interesting guy or a great teacher. No, the Messiah was coming to be a king. That is what the prophets predicted, that Messiah would come and be a king. 2 Samuel chapter 7, in a prophecy given to David, immediately about his son Solomon, but much more broadly about the Messiah that would come and sit on the throne of David forever. Psalm 2 talks about the kingship of Jesus, and he's been given a scepter, and the Messiah rules over the nations, and kings of the earth, judges of the earth, you better pay homage to the Son lest you be destroyed. Psalm 110, of course. The Lord said to my Lord, you'll reign until all your enemies are, are a footstool under your feet. Uh, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 talks about the rule of the Messiah. Daniel chapter 7, and the Son of Man. Again, the rule of the Messiah. The Messiah is a king in all of these passages and others as well that it was predicted in the Old Testament and also believed by Christians in the New Testament is very noteworthy. And so on the right-hand column, we have examples of what Christians actually believed. Christians actually believed that Jesus was their king. Let me give you just <clears throat> a quick couple of examples here just to, to illustrate what I mean by this. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 29, as Peter is preaching his way through the day of Pentecost, uh, he even mentions David in verse 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants upon his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. David knew that the Messiah was going to have a seat on his throne. And who sits on thrones? Kings sit on thrones. Go to chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, it says in verses 30 and 31, Acts chapter 5, verses 30 and 31, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority, power, dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Or like in Philippians 2, our passage at the beginning of the lesson, our scripture reading. And so Jesus is the king of his people. And not just of his people, but he's the king over all the earth. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. So there was only one problem. And it was the problem that Pilate had. And it was the problem that the chief priests had. And it was the problem that Cornelius had. Rome already had a king. And that king didn't particularly like competition. Now at the time that Cornelius was learning the gospel in Acts chapter 10, the emperor of Rome was a man named Caligula. And if you know anything about Roman history... 
What kind of guy was Caligula? <laughs> he was wild. Caligula was a madman. He was absolutely a madman. Now, uh, let me tell you just a, a quick, this will only take a minute here, so bear with me. A little bit of history about Caligula. Caligula actually believed himself to be a living God, as did most of the emperors who came after him, again, to various degrees. Some believed themselves to be more gods than others. Some believed that they would become gods after they died, but they weren't living gods. Caligula was a madman who believed he was, in fact, a living God. And as such, he was held as the highest deity in the empire. Remember, state religion in Rome was extremely important. <clears throat> He was worshipped by the subjects of the Roman Empire. Other religions were tolerated in the Roman Empire as long as they did not interfere with emperor worship. In the Roman Empire, you could have any gods you wanted. You could have any religion you wanted. Brian, you can believe anything you want. Luke, you can believe anything you want. As long as your home religion doesn't somehow interfere with your obedience to state religion. As long as you worship the emperor first, you can have any other gods that you want. Uh, Caligula went mad, by the way, probably because of a severe illness. A lot of historians believe that he started off doing just fine, kind of like Nero did. You know, beginning of his reign was okay, but then he got some kind of disease, maybe a venereal disease. Historians aren't 100% sure what it was. But after this illness, went mad and became increasingly violent and unpredictable and suspicious. Family members, political opponents, even military personnel lived in fear of his wild nature. And unfortunately, soldiers, just like other servants of the empire, were required to take an oath of loyalty. In Latin, that's the title there, in Latin it's Sacramentum Militar, you were required as a soldier of the empire to take an oath of loyalty to the emperor. This sacramentum, as you can see from the word itself, what other English words do we see there in that word? Sacrament or sacred? The sacramentum militar was not just an oath of like civic duty. It was actually an, a religious oath. It was a religious oath. You gave your life over as a sacred offering to the service of the emperor as a living God. That is what the Sacramenta Militar represented. And you were to keep that oath, as a soldier of the empire, you were to keep that oath under punishment of torture or death if you ever violated it. And so it was under these conditions that we come back to Cornelius. That's, we're full circle now, okay? Cornelius came to know Jesus of Nazareth while he was a servant of the Roman Empire. He himself had taken a sacramentum militar and had sworn allegiance, religious allegiance, religious devotion to his emperor Caligula as a living God to be supplanted or placed second by no one else. He was an oath-bound servant of a madman who faced the most important and perhaps most dangerous decision of his life, which is to become a Christian and make Jesus his king. This is even pointed out in Acts chapter 10 as Peter is preaching to him. This choice is made clear to him beginning in verse 34. And opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, for he is, look at this parenthetical statement in verse 36, he is Lord of all. Not Lord of some, not Lord second in command behind Caligula. He's Lord of all. 
you yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up, though, in verse 40. On the third day, and granted that he should become visible, not to all people, but to witnesses who were chosen before, and that is to us, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. And of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And so I think Peter's making it very clear what Cornelius' choice is. Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus has been anointed. And Jesus is judge of the world. Cornelius, I think you know what that means. It was time for Cornelius to count the cost of becoming a Christian. And like all tenderhearted people who fear God, he knew that he needed forgiveness of sins. But at what cost? What was Cornelius' life like after all of this happened? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Was the cost his career? Was the cost his standing in the community? What about his family's well-being, his financial security? What about his life? If his emperor ever found out about sedition in the ranks, what would Caligula do to Cornelius? A sin against the emperor like that would not be forgotten easily. Now, we might not be able to fully appreciate life under a tyrant. But we also have to ask the same questions about our discipleship. Because we face the same choice that Cornelius did. And I, I think, by the way, that we get away with treating it as a very vanilla choice. Because, again, we don't live under Caligula. And we may, we may have criticisms about this president or that president or whatever it might be. We may not like the person who's in charge. We may not like certain things about their policies. But we've never had a president like Caligula. You have never had to live under the thumb of a, of a true, legitimate, power-hungry madman. But Cornelius did. And Cornelius had taken an oath to serve him under penalty of death if he violated it. Becoming a Christian may cost you something also. It may cost you something. And we may find ourselves at some point where the choice is really obvious to us. Now, I can pursue a path of holiness and be more like God and walk the walk of Jesus, and maybe I don't get that promotion Maybe my kids don't make varsity. Maybe I don't live in a certain town because if I, if I move to that town, maybe it won't be good for me or my, my family spiritually, depending on the church situation in that town. You know, all these little decisions that we make, they're very big decisions to us. They're very important decisions to us, but they pale in comparison to Cornelius. And that's why we study Cornelius. That's why I presented it this way, because look at Cornelius. He has basically set the benchmark for us. For Cornelius, literally, the decision was, if I make Jesus my king over Caligula, and Caligula finds out about it, I will be tortured and killed. And that's the benchmark. And so for you... Every other kind of decision that we have to make as Christians is like, well, you're not going to be killed for it. So what is a job after all? What is a promotion after all? Cornelius was willing to risk his life for his king. Can you not risk a little bit of time for your king? 
Risk a little bit of your career for your king. Risk, risk a, a, an unbelieving friend who's standing in the way as a stumbling block to holy living. Can you not risk those things? Because Cornelius risked his life for his king. And if Jesus was really your king, you would take a sacramentum, an oath of allegiance to him, and you would say that under penalty of going to hell, I will ally myself with Jesus and Jesus alone, and he is king of kings and lord of lords, and he gets everything of mine. Everything. Cornelius did it. And I think that's why he's in the Bible, for a lot of reasons, by the way, but I think that's one reason why he's in the Bible. To set that benchmark for us so that we can really know what is at stake in the decision over who our king is. Let's go and end with a word of prayer.